Okay, hello everyone. I hope everyone can hear me and that everyone is seeing this slide, Keto Diets, What You Need to Know. I am Lee Crosby, a registered dietitian with the Barnard Medical Center. Today we're going to talk about that extremely trendy diet, keto. Um, but first I'm just going to do a quick IT check to make sure everyone can actually hear me and that this is going out. Okay, well, I'm going to assume this is working unless I hear otherwise, and I believe Tara Kemp is listening in on this. And so if it's not working, Tara, uh, Tara please just give me a call. So we are going to go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about a lot of things. So here's what we're going to just give you a quick overview. You're going to learn what a keto diet actually is, what the evidence is for various conditions, what the short and long-term risks are, and then some of the frequently asked questions. So questions you or your family members may have had, we're gonna tackle all of those. So first, what is a keto diet? So what exactly is it? It sounds really cute, and we all know someone who's tried one, but what exactly, you know, what exactly does that look like? So a keto diet is actually a diet that drastically decreases carbohydrate intake while greatly increasing fat intake. And technically, theoretically, it's also very low in protein, but in practice, it tends to be very high in protein. So what this diet does is triggers ketosis. That's your body's emergency backup system. And because your body really wants to want to run on glucose, when glucose is not available, then you are going to have to create a substitute so that your brain and your central nervous system have something to run on because they can only run, again, on glucose or a substitute. They can't burn fat directly. But like I said, it's an emergency backup system. So I don't know if you are ready for this right after lunch, but here we go. We're going to talk about that lunch you just ate. We're going to see what happens to it normally. Then we're going to see what happens to nutrients in your body when you're not eating. And then finally, we'll look at what happens to them on a keto diet because it's going to make sense of everything that comes. So put on your seatbelt and get ready for an awesome ride into the world of science and what happens after you chew and swallow your food. So your liver is actually sort of the clearinghouse for everything that comes into your body. We have three main macronutrients. We have protein, we have carbohydrates, and we have fats. So carbohydrates, they come into the body in the form of glucose. They enter the bloodstream as glucose after they're broken down in your digestive tract. And that glucose is actually used to fuel your brain and all the other organs in your body. So what about protein? What happens to that? Oh, and I should say that if you do eat extra, extra carbohydrates beyond what your body needs, it will store them as fat. Um, protein, what happens to that? Uh, enters the bloodstream as amino acids, goes to the liver. Those amino acids are used to help rebuild muscle tissue and any excess that you eat, your body will get rid of the nitrogen waste that's attached to it and then that excess will be stored as fat. And then finally, fats can actually be burned directly by muscle. It is also shunted to the liver and it's a little bit of a different pathway because fats go around the body first before they go to the liver, but eventually they get there and they can also, any excess that you eat will be stored in your own fat cells, which are the little round guys right there. So that's what happens. So, you know, if you ate your, you had some beans and rice and maybe a little avocado on it, the, the carbohydrates and protein and the beans and the fats in the avocado, you can see where all of that goes in your body. So now let's talk about ketosis. So the most severe or intense form of ketosis is actually complete fasting. So abstaining from food, drinking only water. What happens in your body when that's happening? So we have carbohydrates, protein, and fats all disappearing. So what happens? Well, your body is thinks ahead, and it actually has a store of about 10 to 18 hours worth of glucose stored up in your liver in something called glycogen. So your body goes to its little pantry and opens up the, the glycogen pantry and starts taking glucose out of there. So that glucose is used to fuel your brain and your other organs when there's no food coming in. But after six hours or so, your body starts to think, hey, you know what, it could be a little while longer before we get um, any more food in. So we're gonna need to have a backup plan here. So plan A, again, is to eat food. Plan B, your body goes to glycogen. Plan C, your body will actually do something called gluconeogenesis. And what that means, 
Gluco is sugar. Neo means new and Genesis means creation. So the creation of new sugar. Where's your body going to get something to make sugar with? It's going to go raid your muscles. So it's going to take amino acids from your muscles and the ones that can be converted into glucose will be. And again, this is what's going to create glucose for the next little while here, um, for the next day or two. And again, this shows you how many hoops your body is willing to go through to burn glucose as its primary fuel. Now, again, the muscle cells can burn some fat directly, but your brain and central nervous system absolutely cannot. Now, two to three days into this process, your body starts to realize that it's not going to have any muscle tissue left if it keeps up at this rate. So it's going to need to find yet another source for energy. And of course, that source for energy is fat. And what it does is raids your fat, but it gets burned a little bit directly by the muscles, but most of it goes into ketosis, so the formation of ketones, and that is a substitute that your brain can use to, um, that can burn, it's a substitute for glucose, so, and your central nervous system. So your body is making these ketone bodies, and those ketones are the fuel that run your brain and other organs in the body as well. So that's what happens during fasting, which is, again, the most intense form of ketosis. So now how do we trick the body to going into a fasting type state while it's still in a, it's still eating calories? How does that work? Well, we go to a keto diet. And you'll see that carbohydrates just disappeared from the picture there because keto diets, as you know, tend to be very low in carbohydrate. So now how does this work with no carbs coming in? So we have protein and fats coming in. Again, it's supposed to be a low protein diet, but typically in the real world, it's not. Um, so protein comes into the liver in foods and people think, wow, I'm gonna eat all this protein on a keto diet and I'm gonna get huge muscles. And the answer is no. The very bare minimum that will be used will be shunted to the muscles for tissue repair. The rest of it, as you can see with this big arrow, is gonna be pushed into gluconeogenesis as much of it as possible. So your body's gonna use it to make glucose. Um, and what about fat? You're not burning it from storage anymore, you're bringing it in from your diet. So a little bit of it's gonna be burned directly by muscle cells. Um, any excess will get stored in the fat cells themselves. But the majority of it, again, is going to be shunted into ketosis to make ketones, that emergency backup fuel. So this is what's going on on a keto, on a keto diet. Now, what are the different types of keto diets? There's actually more than one. This actually came to us as a surprise to me when I was starting to learn about this. Um, this is the original keto diet. Uh, yeah, that's famine, as we discussed. That is by far the most effective way to induce ketosis. Uh, but what about the kinds of diets that we are going to use more in the modern world? Um, so the classic ketogenic diet here is actually one that is used for reducing the frequency of seizures. So this is actually a medical diet, and Classic here has that medically specific term, and it gets a full 90% of its calories from fat. That leaves only two to 4% from carbs, and just six to 8% of calories from protein. Note that the RDA for protein is usually about 10% of calories. So again, as this diet is used, for, for example, to help reduce seizures in people who are drug resistant for seizures, it's actually a very low protein diet. And I should say that this diet is actually so dangerous that people have to be hospitalized when they start it to make sure everything goes okay. So how about the initiation phase of the Atkins diet that is very much ketogenic? All of a sudden now we're only getting 70% of calories from fat, still really low in carbohydrate, just 5%. And then 25% of calories from protein, so much higher in protein and it actually has a lower rate of ketosis, as you can imagine. Now, generally, when you go, if you are in science or research and you go look at the research papers out there, keto diets or ketogenic diets in general refer to diets that have fewer than 50 grams of carbohydrate per day, which is less than 10% generally of calories from carbs with various amounts of protein and fat. And then interestingly, keto diets are just a subset, a sort of extreme subset of low carb diets so as you can see, low carb diets are any diet that brings you below the RDA or bare minimum for carbohydrate that your body needs to keep running your brain and your central nervous system without kicking in this emergency backup system at all. So this is sort of the level where people start to go into ketosis. And, and again, that varies for different people. In ketogenic diets, we have people definitely in ketosis.
So just to give you an idea for what particularly this classic ketogenic diet looks like in practice, it's often used in children who are resistant to the drugs that are used to control seizures. Um, this is a chicken salad recipe, but as you're going to see, it really is more of a fat salad. So it's about three tablespoons of heavy cream, a one ounce that's just a little small handful, more than two tablespoons of mayonnaise, and then 0 0.7 ounces of chicken, which is less than a third of a very small chicken breast. So really just maybe a few dice in size. So as you can see, this is predominantly a salad made of fat. And that's the point of the diet. Now in the real world, in the wild, this is the kind of breakfast that we are seeing people eat, the kind of meal, as you can see, if it looks like it is pretty much designed to give people heart disease, it kind of is. The only real redeeming value here is the collard greens. So lunch and dinner aren't much better, and I should say that these images are ripped from the blogosphere. Um, so this is, a, this is from a blog talking about more things to do for keto diets, and you can see a lot of oil, a lot of animal products. That top right image, it looks like, wow, we might actually have something healthy there, some vegetables, some whole grain toast, but no, the base of that little stack is actually a fried egg. Yeah, so not optimal. So what is this diet good for? Is there evidence? Because I know, okay, we've talked a little bit about seizures and we'll talk about that, but most people are not going on this to reduce their seizure frequency. They're going on it to lose weight or try and help with their diabetes. So does it actually work for that stuff? Well, just a real quickie because it does work for this. Um, it does help reduce the rate of seizures in people with refractory epilepsy. You note it's not a cure, but it decreases seizures by about 50% in people on that classic keto diet, and then less so on the modified Atkins diet, which has more protein, which makes the diet less ketogenic. So this is where we really start to get into um, what happens, and this is weight management, because this is what most people are using it for. Do keto diets help you lose weight? What do you guys think? Well, yes and no. So they do lead to weight loss, but no more so than any other diets that similarly restrict calories. So they do help people to lose weight, but only because it helps them to eat fewer calories. So this is from a 2013 meta-analysis. Uh, that is a study of other studies. And so the researchers here looked at 13 different trials. And what they did was compare keto diets so we talked about that definition earlier, and they compared those to low-fat diets. Now, I have low-fat in, in quotes there, and if you could see me, you would see that I'm doing air quotes right now because low-fat, by their definition, was less than 30% of calories from fat. Well, just a little bit over 30% of calories from fat is actually sort of the standard American diet intake from fat, so it's not really low-fat. It's more keto versus the standard American diet. And what did they find? They found that uh, over one year, Keto dieters did indeed lose a little bit more weight, but over two years, there was no difference. So what happens in terms of actual weight loss on a keto diet? So again, this is science-y, but bear with me because it's actually very cool science. So this is data. This is a graph from a study where they took, it was done over at the National Institutes of Health. They took 17 overweight and obese men, and they asked them to stay for 60 days, so two months, in a metabolic ward. So basically in a, in a research hospital where, again, they came in and they were there, they lived there, they ate all their food there, they did everything there for two months. Now, what, what's this graph trying to show? So what they tried to do for the first 15 days that the men were in the ward, they actually put them on a diet and adjusted it so that they could get a slow, steady rate of weight loss because that's what they were shooting for. So those first 15 days are not shown on this graph. So those 15 days, they were, again, adjusting the people's calorie intake to get them to a slow, steady rate of weight loss. So then they started, once they got that at around day 15, so this is a, a balanced diet. It's about, it's a little lower in carb than most other diets, but it's about 50% of calories from carbs. I think it's about, I want to say 15% from protein and the rest from fat. So eating a regular sort of standard diet. And then on day zero and losing weight, on day zero, they switched participants to a keto diet. And as you can see on day zero, all of a sudden, blammo, people's weight tanks. It drops a lot pretty quickly. So wow, because these are kilograms over here. So multiply that by about two to get pounds. And 
wow, no wonder, you know, people, they get on a keto diet and the numbers on the scale go down right away and they think, yeehaw, I'm done, problem solved, but not so fast. So that's weight loss on a keto diet. What happens to actual fat loss on a keto diet? Because most of us aren't trying to lose water or lose our muscle tissue. We're trying to lose fat. So fat loss on a keto diet looks a little different. So here you see again, those first 15 days are not shown because they were getting people on a diet to induce a sort of slow, steady rate of weight loss. And from negative 15 here to zero, that's on the balanced diet. They're losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. Zero, they introduce the ketogenic diet. And as you can see, that downward slope suddenly starts to flatten out. Still losing weight or still losing fat, but they're not losing nearly as much, they're not losing it nearly as fast as they were. And in fact, when you actually look at this as a whole, they, their rate of fat loss actually slows a lot when they go on to a keto diet. And in fact, it takes the full 30 days for them to lose the same amount of weight that they had lost in just 15 days on the balanced diet. So after that 30 day mark, the keto diet catches up and they start to lose fat again at the same rate as the balanced diet. But when they first go on the keto diet, the, the rate of fat loss actually slows, even though the weight loss rate or the numbers on the scale go down quickly. But again, those numbers on the scale go down quickly because they're losing fluid and they're losing muscle, but they're not necessarily losing fat. So again, this helps explain why people get very excited at the beginning, but they're not actually accomplishing what they hope they're accomplishing. So what about heart disease? We saw those pictures of people's food on keto diets and if it looked like it was pretty artery clogging, you might be onto something. So we're gonna go back to that same 2013 study of other studies that looked at 13 randomized controlled trials. Those are the gold standard, by the way, for any sort of medical research. And after one year, compared to low-fat diets, the keto diets looked pretty good, actually. People's triglycerides went down. And again, this is air quote, low-fat diets. Their HDL, which is their good cholesterol, went up a little bit. But unfortunately, their LDL, or bad cholesterol, was also higher relative to the low-fat group. And that's not good because increases in bad cholesterol are an increase in heart disease risk. And I should also say that we expect LDL to drop with weight loss. So this is, let's look at one study specifically. This was a 24 week randomized controlled trial or study looking at keto again versus low fat in, in quotes. And they took 120 people who are overweight, had high cholesterol and put them on either one of these two diets and they randomly assigned them and what did they find? Well, again, the keto diet here looks, it looks pretty good, right? They lost 12.9% of their body weight versus 6.7% in the low fat group. Their good cholesterol went up in the keto group, whereas it went down a little tiny bit in the low fat group. So wow, this is not looking good for the low fat group. And the triglycerides went down a lot on the keto diet, more so than on the low fat group. Now, what happened to the LDL? Well, the LDL for the keto group didn't change, which is a little bit surprising because there was no significant difference, but there should have been because they lost twice as much weight in the keto group. So their LDL should have been lower, but it wasn't. And that is looking at the averages in that study. The devil in that study is really in the details. And this is where this diet can be incredibly dangerous. 30% of the folks who completed this study had their bad cholesterol increase by more than 10%. One of them, and this was in the space of about four weeks, their bad cholesterol, not just as a, as a benchmark, you want your bad cholesterol to be 100 or below. So they already started out in a bad place, but within four weeks, they ended up in a really bad place and their doctor actually pulled them from the study. A second person had their cholesterol jump by almost 100 points. Their bad, just the bad cholesterol, not the total by almost 100 points, they had to drop out of the study. And a third person developed chest pain and was diagnosed with coronary heart disease in the course of the study. And of course, their doctor made them leave the study. So it just goes to show that the averages actually hide the really dangerous kinds of effects that this diet can have on certain individuals. So that was looking at older, overweight, and, and obese people. What about people who are young and healthy? Does this diet have the same impact on them? So this was actually a very small pilot study of people who do CrossFit. Now, 
If you are familiar, you know that those are some pretty hardcore people. If you're not, uh, just know that CrossFit is a, an intense sort of workout regimen and almost a community. Um, it pulls from endurance sports and strength training. It combines everything together into one workout. Um, really, you know, these are very fit people. So again, they had 12 participants, small study. They looked at them for three months and they wanted to look at what a keto diet would do to people's body composition. So the percent body fat, their metabolic rate, did that go up or down, how well they performed athletically, and then their blood work. And again, the control group here was actually, the only thing they had them do was just be in the study. They didn't have them actually change their diet versus the ketogenic diet group was trained in a ketogenic diet and asked to follow that for the course of the three months. So keto diet versus no diet change, what did they find? Um, the body composition, the keto group did lose 12% of their body fat. Um, no change in control, but that's not keto magic. That's because the people in the keto group cut their calories by more than 500 per day. There was no change in metabolic rate. There was no change in athletic performance, even though the folks in the keto group actually worked out almost twice as much. So I was surprised that they didn't find a change in athletic performance. Um, and then the blood work, this is beta hydroxybutyrate. That's what BHB is. That's just one of those ketones. So it basically is proving that the keto diet group was indeed in ketosis. And now let's look at what happened to their bad cholesterol, because that's the, the really sort of shady actor here when it comes to heart disease. So in 12 weeks on this keto diet, or looking at this keto diet study, the control group actually didn't have much change. So they started out in a fine place under 100, and it went down a little bit. That was probably, that's probably just sort of due to random chance because it's not that much of a decrease, less than 10 points. But what happened in the keto group, they didn't start in the best place, but in 12 weeks, their bad cholesterol went up 40 points from 114 to 154. So basically by the time these young, healthy, they were average age, I believe was 31, these young, healthy people, by the time they got done with this trial, this diet trial of a keto diet, they needed a statin. And that's really frightening again, because these are, these are young, extremely healthy people. So I also wanted to sort of bring this on an individual level. So this is the case of Jody Gorin. Um, he was 53 years when this sort of saga began, and he actually had clear heart scans. He did sort of a big body-wide thing. It didn't actually have to do with heart disease, but all of his coronary arteries came back looking good and clear. And then he went on a high-fat, low-carb Atkins-style diet. And after 2.5 years, this is a picture of the arteries feeding Jody's heart. Now, to make sense of this for you guys a little bit, um, anything in black and dark gray here is in black in particular is good because that's showing the flow of blood through the arteries. And what you'll see here where the arrow is pointing is there is an artery and then all of a sudden it sort of stops and restarts. And what that arrow is pointing to is a 99% blockage. Again, these arteries had been clear just two and a half years before and when at the start of this diet. And what you can see here again, 99% blockage, that artery in particular is often called the widow maker because when it gets blocked suddenly, um, it tends to result in death, massive heart attack and death. So needless to say, uh, Mr. Gorn immediately had to quit this diet and he actually sued the Atkins company because it was so dangerous and so detrimental to his health. So the other piece here, and this is something that we have known for a long time, that the diet that actually has been proven to reverse heart disease, so help clogged arteries reopen, is the exact opposite of keto. It gets about 10% of its calories from fat. It's based on whole plant foods. So it's either vegan, vegetarian, or very heavily plant-based. We know that this is the kind of diet that can actively reverse heart disease. And again, it is the opposite of a ketogenic diet. All right, so we know keto, no dice for heart disease, but what about diabetes? Now this seems like it might make a little more sense because people with diabetes, they have high blood sugar, right? High blood glucose. And a ketogenic diet is gonna cut out almost all carbohydrates, so they aren't gonna get as much glucose, so their blood glucose won't go up as much. So maybe, maybe this will be the one thing that a keto diet will actually work for. So this is A1C. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's just a measure of someone's blood sugar levels over the previous three months. So this was a study that compared um, people who had type 2 diabetes, put them randomly either on a keto diet 
or a low glycemic index diet, basically, again, a slightly healthier version of the standard American diet, and they wanted to see what happened. So I, I do want to make a little note here that nearly half the people in the keto group dropped out, and we don't have data from the people who dropped out. So these are only the people who were doing well on the keto diet, but such as some people also dropped out of the low GI group, but not nearly as many. So you can see on a keto diet here, um, and I should also say that this study was funded by the Atkins Foundation. So just a little nugget there. But on the keto diet, people's measure of blood sugar over the past three months dropped by 1.5, and that's actually a pretty big number when it comes to A1C. And the low glycemic index diet dropped by 0.5, and that was actually not statistically significant. Um, their fasting plasma glucose, or their blood sugar, dropped by about 20 points on the keto diet, 16 on the low GI. So both of them were certainly improvements. And then blood sugar lowering medications. So a whopping 95% of people on the ketogenic diet were able to stop taking to decrease or discontinue their blood sugar lowering medications. And now two thirds of those on the low glycemic index diet were able to as well. But that's a pretty impressive number. I mean, drop the mic, let's just go home. It looks like we have cured type two diabetes. But not so fast. What I suspect that we are seeing here is, at best, a Band-Aid effect. So keto diets are improving the symptoms of type 2 diabetes, but they're not fixing the underlying problem. And in fact, they may actually make it worse. So let's dive into that. First, it's important to get what causes type 2 diabetes, because most people think of Sugar, right? We think of, well, if they have high blood sugar, then eating sugar must be the cause. Nope. High blood sugar is the symptom of diabetes. And the way I'd like to explain this is that if you step on a nail, you will have pain. That will be your symptom. The pain is not causing the nail. The nail is causing the pain. So you can take a Tylenol for your pain, but the better thing to do would be to fix that underlying cause, which is to take the nail out of your foot. So high blood sugar, just like pain, is a symptom of diabetes. So what's actually the cause for diabetes? Well, there's some good evidence suggesting that it's fat buildup inside the muscle cells. How does that, how in the world does that cause diabetes, right? And again, we're talking type two diabetes here. Well, when you eat a meal, so if you had a sandwich for lunch or you know had some, had some, some beans and quinoa and the big old salad, I'm a dietitian, I have to plug for the big salad. Um, you are going to have all those nutrients get absorbed and any of the carbohydrates in there are going to be absorbed from your digestive tract, as we talked about, into your blood and your blood sugar is going to rise. Even if you're eating something very healthy, and that's a good thing because your, your body wants to run on glucose, you know, within reason. So even if you're eating a sweet potato, your blood sugar is going to rise nice and slow from a sweet potato. And so what your body's going to do to bring that blood sugar back down is going to be to release insulin. And what insulin does is it acts like a key and it basically unlocks the door that lets glucose move from the blood, open the door through the door into your cells because your cells are what's actually going to burn that glucose you know, in their little furnace. So insulin lowers blood sugar by letting glucose get out of the blood, opens the door for glucose to let it get into the cells. So in type two diabetes, and most of the cells that are burning this glucose are that it's muscle and brain, but muscles are the biggest users. Um, what happens in type two diabetes is all of a sudden we have fat building up inside the muscle cells and that effectively acts like gum in the lock. All of a sudden the insulin key can't unlock the door anymore. So your body's still making insulin, but now all of a sudden it's not working as well as it used to. So blood sugar levels, they start to rise, right? Because glucose is trapped in the blood. You get high blood sugar and over time, even if your body's making more and more insulin because it's working less and less well, blood sugars will stay high for long periods of time and eventually that turns into diabetes. So we've covered the cause of type two diabetes. It's that fat buildup inside muscle cells that blocks insulin from doing its job. And it turns out, you would think, wow, a high fat diet, like that's probably not good if the root cause for diabetes is fat building up inside muscle cells. Um, you'd be onto something. It turns out we can actually induce insulin resistance 
in healthy young people, and insulin, insulin resistance is basically making that insulin work less well, getting some gum in the lock so that the key doesn't work, we can induce that with a ketogenic diet. So this is a pretty wild study, and they've repeated this a number of times. And I think they took nine young men, the average age, they were in their 20s, and they put them on, let's take that away for a second, they put them on a keto diet for just three days. And then they also repeated this same, they had a washout period and also put them on a normal diet for three days. And then they challenged patients with something called an oral glucose tolerance test. Now, if you have ever been pregnant and had to be tested for gestational diabetes, you are probably familiar with this. They give you a gnarly, I'm sorry, they give you a clinically important, but from what I've heard, very, very unpleasant tasting uh, glucose drink that you pretty much have to chug. And then they measure your blood sugar, your blood glucose for the next two hours to see what happens to it. So that's what they did to these young men. They put them first on a keto diet and on a normal diet after a, a break. And they wanted to, and then they ran this oral glucose tolerance test afterwards to see what happened to their blood sugar. So ND here is the normal diet. And then the LCHFD is the low carb, high fat diet. And what you will see is that Again, after three days on the low-carb diet, well, first, the, no, the normal diet had a nice normal rise and fall for blood sugar. The low-carb, high-fat diet, their blood sugar went up. Not only did it go up higher, it stayed high, higher much longer than, for longer than the people on the normal diet, or the same people when they were on the normal diet. So interestingly, the reason for this has to do with insulin, as you might expect. Um, again, on the normal diet, there was it was actually pretty, it increased pretty quickly at first, which is what you'd want. And then insulin levels were relatively lower for the rest of it. On the low carb, high fat diet, what you can see is insulin production was sluggish at first. And then it, not only did it catch up to the normal diet, but it exceeded it afterwards and then stayed higher for longer. And that sluggish first phase insulin secretion, it's actually, this test was called a first phase insulin secretion index, that first phase insulin secretion being sluggish like that is actually an early sign of type 2 diabetes. So we can actually, again, sort of trigger the first, the first steps of type 2 diabetes with a ketogenic diet. And this is actually not that surprising. We know that increasing the fat content of the diet from just 35 to 50 percent can cause buildup of fat inside muscle cells in just three days. So probably not the best thing for type 2 diabetes. Now, to make this a little more clear, oops, there we go. I'm going to tell you a story to, about Santa and his toy making machine. So, this is Santa's toy making machine. It takes toy parts on one side and it turns them into these cute little robot toys on the other side. So, the toy parts are glucose, and in this analogy, the machine here is the cell, and these little cute robots are long term health. This is how Santa is able to make all the toys for girls and boys. He's happy about that. Now, after years of neglect, this is Santa's toy making machine. It's gotten more and more gunked up. And since it's only churning out toys very, very slowly, all the toy parts are building up in the workshop. The elves can't move, it's a total mess. So this is analogous to a keto diet, um, or I'm sorry, this is sort of what happens um, in the body after you know we haven't taken good care of our bodies. So if someone is developing diabetes, type 2 diabetes now, um, the glucose builds up in the bloodstream. Why is that happening? Because there is fat gunking up the machine, the cell, or just, you know, junk in the machine. And long-term health is suffering as a consequence. So again, just to make sure that the analogy is clear. So Santa's not happy about this because he knows at Christmas time there's no way he's going to be able to have the elves work in this kind of environment. That workshop is a mess. So he calls in his elf and says, elf, I need you to fix this problem. We are going to call this the keto elf. So keto elf says, okay, this workshop is a mess. It's super cluttered with toy parts. What we are going to do to fix this is not order so many toy parts. So he basically stops ordering toy parts and waits for the machine to kind of eventually slowly crank through the toy parts it already has, and this is a sad little robot. But hey, the workshop looks great. There's very little toy parts in the workshop. So Keto Elf is really happy with himself, and in terms of a keto diet, this is just like what happens. So we have too much glucose in the blood, so we say, hey, you know what? We'll just cut out all the carbohydrates, or almost all of them, and people's blood sugar is going to go down. 
But the problem is we haven't fixed the underlying problem. I mean, unless someone loses massive amounts of weight on a keto diet, they have not fixed the underlying problem. And long-term health, as you can see, is suffering. And so while the keto elf is really happy that the workshop looks great, when Santa comes in, he is very upset. And why is that? Because Santa knows that when it comes Christmas time that year, they're going to need to order more toy parts. And what's going to happen is that as soon as they increase their orders for toy parts and start bringing more in, since the machine hasn't been fixed, what's going to happen is it's still not going to make very many robots in the end. So again, this is like what happens if someone goes off of a keto diet and then reintroduces those health promoting carbs that we know are linked to longevity, your beans and your sweet potatoes. They haven't fixed the underlying problem. So the second they reintroduce carbohydrate, they're very likely to have their blood sugar shoot back up. So of course, Santa not happy about this, and he sends the elf to do what he probably should have done in the first place, which was to clean the junk out of the machine, perhaps with a low fat whole food plant-based diet, which we have actually got some data suggesting that it can help clean out the machine and improve type two diabetes even without weight loss, but it certainly does better with weight loss. And so then what happens? All of a sudden the order has been restored. So we have glucose coming in, the cell now I'm sorry, the machine is all cleaned out. So we have the toy parts coming in, they go through the machine, they turn into our cute little robots again. And the analogy here is that glucose is once again coming into the body, hopefully in the form of, again, things like sweet potatoes and vegetables and beans. And we have cleaned the fat out of the cells, so it is able to use glucose as fuel the way it is supposed to and long-term health results. Santa Claus is happy, the elf is happy, and all the kids are gonna be super happy come Christmas time. So now, with that in mind, I'd like us to return to the keto study that was done for type 2 diabetes. And this time, we are going to put it head-to-head -head with a low-fat vegan diet. Now, both of these studies ran about 24 weeks, give or take. So they're pretty comparable, even though they weren't run together to test the diets head-to-head. -head. So keto diet, we see that people's average blood sugar over three months went down by about one5 um, percentage points, which is certainly good. And then the low fat vegan group also went down 1.2, but not as much, which, okay, we kind of would expect that because again, there's very little glucose coming in with keto. 95% of people in the keto group were able to get off of their blood sugar lowering meds, which again, if they don't, their blood sugar can actually go too low. Only not even half of people in the low fat vegan group could. So wait a second. And then LDL or bad cholesterol, we saw it actually went up a little bit, not significant on the keto diet and went down quite a bit on the low fat vegan diet. But here's the interesting piece. And we're looking at getting at the underlying cause of the disease, not at fixing the symptom. We know that on a low fat vegan diet, people are tolerant of carbohydrates because they improved their, carbo they improved their blood sugar on a high carbohydrate diet, the right kinds of carbohydrates, of course. So on the keto group, if we brought back some beans or some sweet potatoes, the odds are very good that these so-called benefits might actually disappear because they, once they reintroduce carbohydrate, if, they are no, if they're still not able to handle it, they're gonna have the exact same problem as when they started. So keto diets, not great for diabetes. Also, I should note that most people with diabetes actually die from heart disease. And as we know, keto diets are not great for heart disease. So plant-based Santa, he knows best. All right, now on briefly to Alzheimer's disease because this is hitting the news a little bit lately and I know that it's, it's something I think it's on a lot of people's minds. So there is some evidence that in Alzheimer's disease, the brain does not respond well to insulin. And what we saw when that happens is that um, the sugar cannot get out of the blood into the cell where it gets burned as fuel. Well, if that's happening in the brain, that means that it's not going to be, the brain is not going to be functioning as well. So. It's also known as type three diabetes. Um, so there's some thought, hey, if we have someone in ketosis, they can use, their brain can burn ketones instead and they'll get better. So they actually ran um, a study where they used medication to bring about mild ketosis in Alzheimer's patients. And they did get some temporary improvement in symptoms. Um, but the catch is that keto diets are actually very, typically very high in saturated fat. And that's known to increase in the can raise LDL cholesterol, all of which is known to increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease long-term. So they may have some short-term, again, symptomatic improvements like we saw with diabetes where it fixes the symptom, but it may actually be making the underlying cause worse. 
So my big concern is when people start a keto diet thinking, wow, I'm going to lower my risk of Alzheimer's with a keto diet. And that's actually just not true. They're probably increasing their risk because of all the things we've talked about to this point. So if you are interested in getting a little more information on Alzheimer's disease and healthy diets for reducing your risk, these are two great books, Power Foods for the Brain, The Alzheimer's Solution, highly recommended. Now, benefits and risks. I wanna sort of recap things and cover a few things we didn't before. There are some benefits to keto diets. I tried to keep an open mind when I was putting this talk together. Um, we know they help reduce seizure frequency for people who are resistant to medications. They do decrease calorie intake. Uh, because it gets kind of boring. Um, they improve blood sugar control because there's almost no carbs coming into the body. And they do decrease triglycerides and increase good cholesterol. So that's those are the benefits. Now let's get ready for some of the risks and side effects. I've broken them down into short and long-term. Short-term side effects, uh, micronutrient deficiencies. So the um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has made mention of this, and there have been lots of studies showing that People tend to be deficient in multiple vitamins and minerals, particularly on these medical versions, so they need to supplement. Um, if you increase your intake of fat and animal products and decrease your fiber intake, you have a no-go situation. Uh, nausea, fatigue, this is all the sort of suite of symptoms is, I'm gonna say affectionately, again, with more quotes there, known as the keto flu. It usually happens the first few weeks people are on a keto diet. And it actually can, as we saw in these studies, it can actually impair glucose tolerance if someone were to reintroduce a carbohydrate food. But wait, there's more. It's almost like a drug commercial. So also impaired artery function in the short term. We know that a single high fat meal can actually interfere with an artery's ability to widen. We know that they increase bad cholesterol. They impair athletic performance, particularly sprint performance. Um, animal foods, which tend to be a centerpiece of Keto diets are, tend to be high in purines, and that can increase the risk of a gout attack. That's a painful form of arthritis. And um, one of the ketones that your body makes when it is making ketones is acetone. Now, ladies, if you've ever taken off your nail polish, you'll know that's the main ingredient in nail polish remover. And the way your body gets rid of acetone, which is actually a waste product of ketosis, is by off-gassing it in your breath. So your breath will smell like acetone. So some of those are funny, but the long-term risks are not funny at all. So low carbohydrate diets, of which keto is the most extreme form, have an increased risk of all-cause mortality. That's dying from anything. So if you've lost five pounds and you have a heart attack, it is not, it is not accomplished what, it does not accomplish what people hope. Um, increased risk of colon cancer. Of course, people are increasing their intake of red processed meats. Um, white meat not off the hook here, grilled white meats, the charring on those tends to contain carcinogenic heterocyclic amines, um, decreasing fiber, all that increases colon cancer risk, increased risk of kidney stones with that increased intake in animal products, and increased exposure to pollutants um, when you're eating high fat animal products because animals bioaccumulate these um, fat soluble herbicides and pesticides in their fat tissue when people eat them, then they are eating concentrated persistent organic pollutants. And again, there are more long-term risks. This one really gets me an increased risk of birth defects in women of reproductive age, 30% increase in risk of um, anencephaly and spina bifida. Those are, those are severe and often unsurvivable birth defects, likely due to low folate intakes. And the problem is they happen in the first month of pregnancy when most women don't even know they're pregnant. So I strongly, I mean, I, this diet's not good for anyone pretty much, very few exceptions, but certainly not for women of reproductive age. Um, long term, it can actually um, injure artery walls. There's some data for that, impaired artery function, and worse than heart disease. So just to wrap up with some FAQs, what about vegan keto? Oh, well, I wish I could tell you we don't have any trials on vegan keto. We do have a borderline low-carb vegan uh, study, study of the Eco Atkins diet, and you can see it's right at the, the lowest RDA level for carbohydrates. And it was also not just that, it was very high in soluble fiber, which is known to lower bad cholesterol and vegetable protein. So here's the breakdown that you can see. And what did they find? They find that people did lose some weight, their bad cholesterol went down, their triglycerides, um, which also went down, both of those are good, and their 10-year risk of having a cardiovascular event dropped by 2%, which is you know certainly great. It's better than a standard keto diet, it appears, um, or at least as good. 
But the thing that we know is that a low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet doesn't just drop your re risk by you know two percent. It can actively reverse cardiovascular disease and heart disease. So definitely not as good. But it may it's not as good as a whole-food, plant-based diet. But it's probably it's probably better than standard keto. Um, are keto diets the same as high-protein diets? What do you guys think? Whether you think yes or no, you're both right. In theory, they are actually low in protein because if you have too much protein, your body will use that to make carbohydrates, which defeats the purpose. In practice, they tend to be very high in protein as we saw from the pictures from blogs. And there are people who say they feel better on a keto diet. What's going on with that, right? Especially with the keto flu and everything. Well, some people just feel amazing when they lose weight, no matter how they lose it. It's a self-esteem boost and they feel good about it. If someone's drinking a lot of sodas and eating Twinkies and then they switch to a keto diet where they're eating large amounts of non-starchy vegetables and little of other things that could improve things, that's not how most people do it, but you never know. Again, more vegetables. Some people might have a trigger food. They could have celiac disease that was undiagnosed and when they cut wheat out of their diet, they felt better, but it's not because of the keto diet. It's because they um, had celiac and they cut out uh, the trigger for that, which would be, which would be wheat. So again, the goal here is to figure out, hey, why does that person feel better on a keto diet? Or why did I feel better on that, you know, low carb diet I did a long time ago, if that happened, for most people it doesn't. But then to get that benefit on a safe eating plan. And then bulletproof coffee. I don't know if y'all have heard of this, but wow, it's pretty, I don't want technical terms bonkers, I think. So what is it if you haven't heard of it? Well, it is a cup of coffee. So far, so good. Uh, a tablespoon to two of butter, and for authenticity, you would use yak butter. I'm not making this up. You can Google it. One to two tablespoons of octane oil. This is a medium chain triglyceride oil, and you better use the fancy kind because if you use a lesser octane oil, you can get a side effect called disaster pants. I will leave that to your imagination. Again, you can Google this. And what you end up with is a 480 calorie cup of coffee with about one quarter cup of pure fat, most of it saturated. So if you want to be healthy, I recommend that you run, not walk away from bulletproof coffee. So summary, keto diets, they're your emergency backup system. They're great if you have drug resistant seizures and you have not been able to control them with meds. Mixed results for other conditions, I think is a magnanimous way to put it. There are lots of side effects and risks Again, including an increased risk of dying from any cause. And they eliminate the foods that we know are most linked to health and longevity. So not a risk worth taking. We know that fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, peas, and lentils are optimal foods for health. So best to stick with those. Now, if you want more, there's the exam room podcast by the Physicians Committee, which has a couple of great episodes on keto diets, 21 Day Vegan Kickstart app. And now we are going to switch over and take some of your questions, which I think, if there are any, will be in a Google Doc, so bear with me. Okay, we have a question from Emmanuel, wondering about a plant-based, mildly ketogenic diet, uh, written by Dr. Bredson, who wrote End of Alzheimer's, so again, is a plant-based ketogenic diet, we don't have, we just don't have data on this. I, I do wish that they would start publishing some papers in some peer-reviewed journals so that I could get hold of this. Um, in terms of someone who is actually already in cognitive decline or has Alzheimer's, again, there is some data to suggest that this could be beneficial in terms of getting some fuel into their brain. But in terms of reducing the risk, I absolutely do not see how this kind of a ketogenic style of diet um, can, can reduce the risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. So again, I think there's potential use there in terms of treatment, but in terms of prevention, I don't think so. Certainly I will say that a plant-based diet and you're saying mildly ketogenic, um, that's gonna certainly be less of an issue um, because plant foods, as you know, have all kinds of health benefits of their own. So there might be enough good protective stuff in there um, to counterbalance the less optimal parts. So until I have can read some published data from them, I'm going to withhold withhold judgment. But my initial thought would be that you're still much better off on a whole food plant based diet that does not try to induce ketosis. So I think 
that might be the only question we have. You guys have a couple, another minute to get your questions in. And I think we're good. So thank you guys for joining for this Facebook Live. I appreciate your attention and your time. And again, I will put this lovely little slide back up so that you guys can check out some of the resources we have. And also, if you want to hear a version of this talk that was given to healthcare providers at the International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine last year, you can actually hop on YouTube and just search my name, Lee Crosby, L-E-E-C-R-O-S-B-Y, on the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine YouTube channel, and you can check out the version of this that was given to um, doctors, nurses, dietitians, and medical researchers. So thanks so much for your attention and have a great afternoon.